Suzume Iwato lost her mother at a young age and spent most of her life living with her aunt. Just like other girls, her life is filled with optimism and happiness, until one day, she encounters a boy who deals with supernatural threats to their society. When the boy is cursed by a god to become a chair, she is forced to take his role and discover the truth about her supernatural past. Find out this truth in the tale of Suzume's door locking. So let's get started as the story opens. A girl desperately runs through a field of crops in search of her mother. Yet, despite venturing as far as she could see, her efforts yielded no results. As the girl cries from fear of abandonment, she overhears the footsteps of a woman approaching her. She thinks it's her mother, but the shock jolts her awake. At that moment, her aunt and caretaker, Tamaki, calls her downstairs for breakfast. She makes a delicious meal and prepares her lunchbox for school, and she mentions that dinner will be in the fridge as returning home from work tonight might be difficult. Suzume makes an assumption concluding that Aunt Tamaki is going on a date. She playfully adds that she's welcome to take all night if necessary. However, Tamaki reveals that her event management preparations require overtime attention. Eventually, her aunt takes the car whereas Suzume hops on the bike to go their separate ways. As she smoothly cycles through the empty road, Suzume notices a young man named Sota walking in her direction. His handsome looks are more than enough to make her blush and slow down the bike. As the two slowly pass by each other, Suzume catches a glimpse of his face and wavy hair from up close, leaving her in awe. Suddenly, Sota calls out to her, asking if she would be kind enough to point him in the right direction. Strangely enough, he is searching for some kind of ruins or a door in those ruins. Despite being confused, Suzume mentions an abandoned town at the back of the mountain that could be what he's looking for. The boy appreciates her help and continues his journey to the abandoned city, ending their chance encounter with Suzume in a state of confusion. Still, she can't forget their encounter even on her way to school. Her friend, Aya, joins her at the level crossing and points out that Suzume is blushing. When the rail car moves past the crossing, Suzume jumps on her bike and decides to follow Sota. She's confused about this decision, but her legs move on their own. Upon reaching the bottom of the mountain, Suzume abandons her bike and continues the journey on foot. After tripping and falling along the way, she eventually finds the abandoned city. Without any prior clues, she calls him out in vague words. After walking through the city, she finds a door in the middle of a shallow puddle that Sota was asking directions for. She hesitantly opens the door only to discover a strange new place on the other side. However, Suzume passes through the door and walks out from the other side. She constantly goes back and forth, trying to cross dimensions and visit the new place, but her efforts are all in vain. Suddenly, she stumbles upon a relic, stuck inside the pond. Upon picking it up, it transforms into a white cat and runs away. Eventually, she quit trying it out of fear and returned to school for class. Suddenly, a small magnitude earthquake hits the island, causing everyone to panic. As things settle down, Suzume sees a strange black smoke coming from the direction of the abandoned city. Yet, none of her classmates can see the incident unfold. Little by little, the black smoke spreads into the sky, forcing her to investigate its origins. On her way back to the abandoned city, she notices that the smoke is coming from the direction of the door. Upon getting closer to the door, Suzume finds Sota desperately trying to fight the black smoke and closes the door. Unfortunately, her sudden appearance on the scene distracts Sota from closing as he worries about her safety. The moment he tells Suzume to escape before things get dangerous, the black smoke throws him back against the wall. At that moment, Suzume rushes to the other side for Sota's help. In the meantime, the black smoke opens the door wide and escapes into the sky like a cloud, causing an earthquake of 6.6 .6 magnitude. Unexpectedly, a piece of glass drops on Suzume's head, forcing Sota to jump in the line and injure his arm. Still, he is determined to close the door, otherwise the consequences would be beyond imagine. Instead of succumbing to her fears, Suzume jumps into action and helps him push. The extra force gives him time to recite a mysterious spell that will lock the door. As he continues to chant, Suzume looks at him and recalls a faint childhood conversation with the boy in her childhood. In that instance, he finished casting and locked the door for good. Afterward, Sota bombards her with questions only to discover that Suzume lacks any knowledge of the circumstances. Ultimately, Sota tells her to run back home and forget everything that happened today. However, Suzume doesn't listen. Instead, she forces him to follow her back home for first aid. As Suzume applies a bandage to the wound, 
Soda explains that the black smoke known as a worm is a powerful force that exists under the islands of Japan. It rages wherever the land is disturbed by external forces. However, it is his job to find the keystone that should have been near the gate and seal it completely. Otherwise, the worm will escape again. At that moment, the white cat from earlier enters Suzume's room through the window and utilizes its charm to get free snacks. Suzume adores the cat and invites it to stay at her house. Unexpectedly, the cat starts talking like a human, confessing that it likes Suzume. However, things are different in Soda's case as the cat hates him for some reason. The cat casts a strange curse on Soda and transforms him into a small chair. Instantly, Soda blames the cat for his condition, but it runs into the street. Naturally, he is forced to chase the cat, as it is his only clue about the curse. In the meantime, Tamaki returns home early, worried about Suzume after the earthquake. However, Suzume is more worried about the fact that there is a chair moving around the city by itself. Despite chasing the cat across town, they fail to comprehend it from jumping on a boat to mainland Japan. That night, Suzume calls Tamaki to make an excuse that she's staying over at Aya's house. Tamaki permits her to do a sleepover without much questioning. Still, what's more concerning is a man's bag in Suzume's room. She assumes that Suzume might be dating, but their call disconnects before her questions are answered. Afterward, Suzume buys snacks and runs aboard the ship with Sota on their way to mainland Japan, where the cat is probably going. Despite her kind gestures, Sota refuses to eat as he is more worried about a gate reappearing at other places. Also, he's the chair. He tells Suzume about the curse that the cat placed on him. This is when she reveals that there was a strange relic near the first gate, which transformed into a cat. Immediately, Soda confirms the relic is called a keystone, in charge of keeping the gate sealed. However, he can't understand the reason why it would abandon its duty to go sightseeing. Naturally, Suzume feels guilty about freeing the keystone and Soda's current state. Yet, Soda blames himself, as it's his job as a closer to arrive early at these places and prevent earthquakes. Nonetheless, he must find and return the keystone to banish the worm for good. After all, this is the only way for him to retrieve his human self. He also advises Suzume to return home once the ship docks at the mainland. The following morning, Suzume wakes up to the same dream and the sound of people leaving the ship. She notices that Sota is sound asleep, forcing her to accompany him on the mainland. After some time, Sota wakes up from his slumber, only to find out that the cat is an internet sensation and going viral rapidly. The people also name him Daijin because of his weird traveling habits. At that moment, Suzume decides to continue searching for the cat with Soda instead of going home. He tries to persuade her into returning, but she doesn't listen. Furthermore, she reveals that a walking chair is also rapidly going viral, implying her help is mandatory for him. But there's no implication that you need to like this video and subscribe to my channel. Wait, you thought I'd ask you? No, I'm telling you that on this channel, you'll find plenty of fun stories in the shoujo genre. So come on, hit that subscribe and give me a like. As the day passes, Suzume and Sota follow the internet trail to reach an isolated highway in the countryside. Suddenly, a girl named Chika hits the speed bump a little too hard, causing her stuff to fall out of the box. Without wasting a single second, Sota grabs a green sheet from the side of the road and saves the day with Suzume's help. The two juniors sit down on the roadside, where Suzume reveals details about her search for a cat. Naturally, Shika is surprised to see that a girl would come this far searching for a cat of all things. Suddenly, the laughter turns into pin drop silence, as Suzume and Sota see a worm appearing far from their location. She quickly takes her things and makes a run for it, knowing that an earthquake might be on its way. However, both of them realize that they won't make it on time to close the gate before things get out of hand. Luckily, Chika comes to her help and gives a ride to the abandoned school nearby. On their way into the mountains, Soda jumps from Suzume's hands and tells her to return with Chika as closing the gate could prove to be life-threatening. He makes his way to the school only to discover that it has become another gate. Soda pushes the door with all of his strength, but the wooden body proves ineffective. Furthermore, he also loses the key to lock the door adding more trouble to the situation. The moment he is about to give up on closing the door, Suzume arrives to provide backup. Instead of arguing, Soda tells her to imagine life at the location before the school was abandoned. 
It is as if Susan may gain the ability to peer into the past of those who lived before here. Simultaneously, Soda casts the same sealing spell as before, allowing Suzume to shut the gate without causing the earthquake. In that instance, Daijin appears on the scene and tells them about future gates opening. He leaves before Soda gets a chance to talk about his curse. A while later, Suzume calls Tamaki to inform her about their journey to the mainland, giving her on to headache. Tamaki can't understand Suzume's reasoning behind such foolishness, as yesterday she was supposedly at Aya's house. Minoru and a colleague notice her lecturing Suzume on the phone, concluding that Suzume is in her rebellious phase. In the meantime, Tamaki continues lecturing her, but Suzume hangs up the phone before she can finish. Meanwhile, back on the mainland, Chika lets Suzume stay at her house for the night and cooks a meal for two people. Suzume invites Soda for dinner, but it turns out chairs don't need any food to survive. Who would have guessed? Over the table? Suzume receives another novel from Tamaki, questioning her safety and sleeping arrangements. She puts her phone aside and comments that Tamaki needs to date someone. She believes that Tamaki wasted her prime years raising her instead of focusing on her life. Speaking of dates, Chika wonders if Suzume has ever had a boyfriend. She hasn't, earning her a lot of praise from Chika. They continue talking about this topic as Chika loves badmouthing her ex-boyfriend and boys in general. Uh, don't badmouth me. Later that night, Chika asks about the origins of the wooden chair with three legs. Unexpectedly, Suzume reveals that it is a memento from her late mother, not knowing that Soda is listening to their conversation. Despite not knowing the details, Chika believes that Suzume is doing something big for the world. The next morning, Suzume comments on some people waking up super late than others. Naturally, Chika gives her cheeky advice, saying that a kiss from a girl would wake anyone. Afterward, they enjoy breakfast with the rest of the family where Suzume sees Daijin crossing the bridge to Kobe. She instantly runs to Soda, informing him about the cat sighting. At the same time, Chika knocks on her door to give her a dress. As the two of them part ways, Chika gives her a hug and hopes that Suzume will visit again in the future. A while later, Suzume and Sota reach the highway to Kobe, hoping someone will give her a lift. As a few cars pass by, Sota tells her to be more aggressive in her approach and waves her hands. However, Suzume thinks Sota should just walk around the road, which would definitely catch everyone's attention. After some time, the clouds begin to pour heavily, forcing them to take shelter under the bus station. Luckily, a woman named Rumi with two children stops the car to help her. She begins the conversation, revealing their return to the city from a visit to Grandma's house. Unexpectedly, the kids on the backside open Suzume's backpack to find the weird-looking chair. Despite their mother scolding them, the children continue to stare at the chair with curious eyes. Eventually, the kids let go of their restraints and use the chair as their snack table. Naturally, they try to spill some food over the chair, but each time, Soda prevents it. Over time, the kids throw their drinks on him as they are curious about the chair's advanced mechanism. Upon entering the city, Rumi reveals that there was an amusement park behind the mountains which was a treat for all the children. However, now it has been closed and they don't even have the money to tear it down. There are a lot of abandoned places nowadays all across Japan. Suddenly, Rumi receives a phone call from her daycare to inform her that the shop is closed. Thankfully, she deals with the trouble by employing Suzume as the kid's nanny. The kids are quite troublesome as they cause destruction around the house for Suzume to clean up. They also climb up on her like Mount Fuji. So Suzume signals to Soda that his help is needed. He acts like a chair toy and jumps out of the bag to grab the kid's attention. Initially, Suzume is shocked to see him make a move. However, she quickly creates a cover story for the kids saying it's an advanced robot toy. One by one, the kids ride the chair like a horse which tempts Suzume to take a turn. Yet, Soda accidentally blurts out a few words, refusing her wishes. Suddenly, the kids are shocked to know that a wooden chair can talk like a human. The change of events forces Suzume to lie that the chair has an advanced AI installed, giving it the ability to speak. Back on the island, Minoru acts completely insensitive and starts to share stories about his rebellious phase. Yet, Tamaki doesn't care one bit, as she is more worried about Suzume. At this point, she thinks that her method of raising her might have some flaws, which might be the reason they can't communicate with each other. Upon seeing her in this state, Minoru suggests that she can track Suzume's movement with her phone's GPS. However, 
Things like GPS are beyond her. Luckily, she has access to Suzume's bank account, with purchases revealing that she's in Kobe. Ultimately, Tamaki decides to take time off from work and visit Kobe to ensure Suzume's safety. Meanwhile, at Rumi's house, the kids finally fall asleep, giving Suzume the time to take a long breather. Unexpectedly, Rumi asks her to help out at their workplace because they are short-staffed. To Suzume's utter shock, the single mother who looked very innocent runs a bar. Still, she knows better than to allow a 16-year-old to work on the floor with old drunks all around. For the next few hours, Suzume works in the back, doing things like cleaning dishes, bringing dishes to the servers, and of course, serving drinks. This goes on for a while until Suzume finds Daijin chilling in one of the bar's VIP seats. Naturally, none of the others can see him sitting on the chair, much like they can't see the worms. Eventually, Suzume abandons her duties at the bar to run after the cat into the streets. Before going far, she informs Sota about the cat as well, thus adding him to the cat chase. After chasing it for a while, Suzume catches up with the cat, only to find a worm escaping into the sky. At the same time, Sota reminds her that closing the gate is their utmost priority. They announce that the worm is coming out of the abandoned amusement park that Rumi told her about that morning. Upon reaching the park, they discover that the ferris wheel has turned into a gate. Simultaneously, they find Daijin standing on top of the wheel locking down on them with cocky eyes. In that instance, Soda asks Suzume to take care of the gate while he wipes off that grin on the cat's face. As the two move in the opposite direction, Soda jumps on the roller coaster rail and concludes that his new body of his is flexible. On the other hand, Suzume rushes to the gate and pushes it back before the worm escapes. Daijin loves all the work she's putting in, but he needs to escape, as Soda is right behind him. Soda tells the cat to transform back into the keystone and resume its original place. He jumps from one rail to another to capture the cat once and for all. Their fall accidentally turns on the power of the park, capturing the attention of everyone across the city. The switch also powers up the ferris wheel, forcing Suzume to close the gate in mid-air. She struggles to climb up the cockpit, only to see a sky filled with thousands of stars and her mother giving the chair to her. She is instantly drawn to step into the gate and reunite with her mother. In the meantime, Soda reminds Daijin that the eastern pillar of the seal won't hold back the worm without its help. He tells Daijin to transform back into the keystone and resume his original place. However, Daijin insists that he isn't interested in this duty. Daijin wants to stay with Suzume. Suddenly, Soda's attention is diverted towards the ferris wheel, only to find Suzume on her way to fall down. He tries to remind her that mortals can't enter the gate, but the temptation is too great. With no choice left, Soda decides to save her by casting the ceiling spell on the key. This reminds Suzume of all the happy memories that people made in the amusement park years ago, hence allowing her to close the gate and avoid an earthquake. Afterward, Suzume begins trembling out of fear of the worm, but Soda praises her efforts to calm her down. He is curious about the things Suzume saw on the other side of the gate, which managed to captivate her beyond return. She tells him about the stars and the fields, but decides to keep the rest of the details to herself. After listening to her explanation, Soda reveals that the gate is the other side of their world in which their souls rest after death. It can be considered the ever after, except it also housed the worm. Still, no mortal can or should enter the gate, otherwise the consequences would be unimaginable. After returning to the bar, Rumi gives her a long lecture on running away at this time of night. However, she stops when Suzume's stomach growls from not eating. Later in her room, Suzume discovers that Sota is a grad student on track to becoming a teacher. Still, he can't abandon his family's duty of closing gates, even if it doesn't make any money. That night, as everyone sleeps, Sota begins to feel his soul drifting away, and the light growing dimmer with each passing moment. He finds himself on a cold snowy beach, with the door in front of him, yet his feet and the rest of his body begin to freeze in one place, making it impossible for him to move, until Suzume opens the door from outside and takes him out. She uses Chika's advice to help him regain consciousness, but Sota is unaware of this fact. The next morning, Rumi drops her off at the train station and advises her to contact Tamaki before things get awkward. Unfortunately, she completely forgot about her poor aunt who called her 50 times. Still, she buys a ticket to Tokyo, as saving the world is more important. 
she is super excited to ride a bullet train for the first time and experience traveling at super high speeds. After reaching Tokyo, Sota directs her as navigating proves to be a challenge in a large city. Before resuming their search for Daijin, Sota decides that they need to visit his house. Suzume takes the keys to his apartment from the owner of a grocery store while also discovering that he's super popular with the ladies. Who would have guessed? Upon making their way inside the apartment, Sota asks Suzume to grab a box from the top shelf. Little did he know that she would use him as a boost to reach the top shelf without asking. Afterward, Sota takes out an old book passed down in his family through generations. It revealed that the worm had been sealed by two separate keystones, one in the west and the other in the east. Daijin was the keystone that sealed the tail of the worm while its head was sealed at the center of Tokyo. He assumes that Daijin wants to unseal the worm's head and cause destruction like 100 years ago. However, the location of the other keystone has been erased from their family's records for safety purposes. At this point, he has to visit his grandfather in the hospital, who will definitely scold him for screwing up an important mission. Suddenly, Tomoya, Soda's friend, knocks on the door in search of Soda. Immediately, Suzume begins panicking as Tomoya might misunderstand the situation, yet, Soda insists she gets rid of him while he hides in the corner. He also assures her that Tomoya is a nice person so she won't be in danger. Eventually, Suzume opens the door and introduces herself as Soda's cousin like a sister. Initially, he is suspicious of her true identity but moves on. Unexpectedly, Tomoya reveals that he and Soda had a pretty important test yesterday that would have decided Soda's future as a teacher. Yet, Soda never showed up to the exam which also distracted him, leading him to flunk. Before leaving the room, Tomoya states that his relationship with Soda will end after getting his money Soda owes him. At that moment, Suzume sees a large worm in front of the apartment, concluding that the gate might be near, immediately after removing the keystone and forcing him to miss an important exam. However, he dismisses the situation as fate so that she can focus on the matter at hand. While running on the footway, Soda finds Daijin and starts chasing him on the road. After pining for him on the road, Daijin reminds him that one keystone isn't enough to hold the gate. Yet, Daijin laughs at the matter, questioning if Soda hasn't understood the reality of things. With that said, Daijin escapes into the traffic, forcing him and Suzume to continue searching for the gate. They manage to find the gate, but locking it with a key seems impossible. Suddenly, the earthquake begins to shake the streets and buildings. Yet after a moment, the worm and the quake suddenly stop. Suzume is confused by this development, but Soda knows that they have failed in stopping the worm from escaping. Within a few seconds, the body of the worm escapes the gate, causing immense earthquakes. At that moment, Soda realizes that this is something that a closer can accomplish. He apologizes to Suzume for everything and jumps into the worm. However, Suzume jumps into the worm after him. Unlike Soda, she can't stand firm on the body of the worm, which causes her to fall. Thankfully, Soda notices her falling down just in time and runs down to save her. As each moment passes, the worm spreads across Tokyo, ready to fall at any time and cause an earthquake that will kill millions of people. Moments later, Daijin comes along and informs them that the earth is going to break. Naturally, Suzume wants to know why it won't return to its original form. However, Daijin reveals that the keystone has been passed down to Soda. In that instance, as Soda realizes the gravity of the situation, his body begins to freeze and transform into the keystone. Yet, Suzume refuses to insert him into the worm and sacrifice his life to save the world. As the time draws near, Daijin pushes Suzume to the brink by reminding her that millions of people are going to die. In that end, she is left with no choice but to act on Daijin's will and use the keystone to banish the worm. As they fall, Daijin saves her by transforming into a balloon. Coincidentally, she finds herself in front of the gate at the heart of Tokyo. She can clearly see Soda on the other side, but none of her words reach him. In the end, she has no choice but to close the door with a spell. Strangely enough, Daijin is happy that Suzume is all hers. However, she calls Daijin a traitor and blames him for Soda's death. Eventually, she tells Daijin to go away and never show his face, making him sad. Afterward, she goes outside of the sewers only to be a topic of gossip among the locals as her shoes and clothes are destroyed. Nonetheless, she visits Soda's grandfather to reveal the truth about him being sealed. Upon seeing her at the door, he immediately realizes that his grandson failed to accomplish his mission. He also makes it clear that Soda is gone and can never return to the mortal world. 
Yet, Suzume insists on finding a way to save him. Initially, Soda's grandfather tries to make her honor his sacrifice to save the world, but his efforts are in vain. Ultimately, he reveals that Suzume must have gotten lost in the Ever After in her childhood. Now the only way to save Soda is to find the gate from which she first entered the world of the dead. After she leaves the room, a cat shows up at his door. He treats it with familiarity and calls him his old friend from the past. But their conversation ends when Soda's grandfather asks the cat to keep Suzume safe. After washing herself, she prepares to visit her hometown and find the door from her childhood. Unexpectedly, Tomoya sees her passing through the streets and asks her where she is headed. Naturally, Suzume tries to fend him off, but the soon-to-be teacher reads her like a book, concluding that something has happened to Soda. He also knows that the whole, I am his cousin, is a bunch of lies. Still, Suzume insists on diverting the story which forces him to stop her by force. The moment Tomoya tells her to get in the car, her aunt Tamaki shows up out of nowhere. Before saying anything to Tomoya, she expresses her worry about Suzume's safety. At that point, she assumes that Tomoya is the guy who is at their house and advises Suzume to quit listening to him. However, Suzume jumps in his car, knowing that it is her only way to her hometown. Unexpectedly, Tamaki also takes a seat in the car as she is worried sick about Suzume's safety. They then argue making a scene. A few moments later, Daijin tells them to stop fighting like children, which scares both Tomoya and Tamaki. Luckily, Suzume changes the subject by telling them they are just hearing things. Ultimately, Suzume inserts the location of her hometown and takes the back seat beside Daijin. She tells Tomoya to start driving since he offered to help. Along the way, Suzume falls asleep, allowing her aunt to chat with Tomoya. As their conversation progresses, Tomoya mistakes her for Suzume's mother, but Tamaki reveals that she found Suzume in the snow, desperately searching for her late mother. They both wonder if Soda will be there in Suzume's hometown. She thinks that they should just turn back and call it a day. However, Tomoya wants to collect the 20,000 yen that Soda borrowed from him. Suddenly, both Daijin and Suzume wake up to the earth shaking. Yet, no one else notices the earthquake until the warning pops up on their phones. Suzume tells Tomoya to stop the car, assuming that a gate might be near. However, upon taking the high ground, she doesn't find any gate. She tries to talk with Daijin, but he's still upset about her outbreak from earlier. With no clue to be found, the search party hits the road once again. Suddenly, heavy rainfall begins which forces Tomoya to close the rooftop of the convertible. Unfortunately, Tomoya shows that the roof doesn't close since he bought it for cheap. In the end, they are forced to get drenched and drive to the next gas station, which is approximately 30 minutes away. There, Tamaki calls Minoru to explain their developing situation regarding Suzume and her encounter with Tomoya. Immediately, Minoru feels jealous of the guy with the convertible and tells Tamaki to return as soon as possible. In that instance, another earthquake of magnitude 3 hits them again, which makes Tamaki worry for Suzume. She goes outside to ask about her motives behind the trip. However, Suzume stays silent about her motives, forcing Tamaki to get furious. Their fight escalates as Suzume bluntly says that it wasn't her choice to live with her aunt. These words break Tamaki's heart, and she questions her own decisions to raise Suzume by sacrificing her prime years. She tells Suzume all the money she inherited from her sister's death didn't compensate for her not being able to live her own life. After some time, Suzume noticed that Tamaki wasn't talking about things of her own volition. Instead, the second keystone, named Sadaijin, was manipulating her. The moment she realizes what has happened, Tamaki runs inside to Tomoya and cries her eyes out. Ultimately, they continued their journey the next morning under the sun. Along their way, Tomoya mentions that cats don't follow people unless they have a reason, especially since they are not selfless like dogs. Suddenly, Sadaijin confirms his hypothesis, which instantly catches their attention. Before long, they are about to hit a truck. However, Tomoya manages to save them from crashing. Still, he accidentally drives down the hills, which does fix the roof so at least one positive thing happened. At this point, Suzume runs off with the two cats on foot, but Tamaki follows suit with a bicycle that was lying around. On their way, they make up with each other, as both are reminded of the time they spent together. With that said, Tamaki concludes that Suzume is desperately searching for Soda because of her feelings for him. She also learns from Suzume that the two cats are actually gods. Upon reaching her hometown, 
Suzume digs up a hole in the ground to find her diary from the past. As she turns the pages, she learns that her dreams from her childhood days were indeed real. Within the pages, she learns that the door to the Ever After is a telephone booth, yet there are no signs of any buildings nearby. Luckily, Daijin points her in the right direction, helping her find the door behind some plants. In that instance, she understands that Daijin was guiding them to close the doors all along instead of opening them. She appreciates his help, leading them to make up with each other. The moment they enter the Ever After, Suzume finds the place a bit different from before. Sadaijin transforms into his original form to fight the worm, while Daijin helps Suzume reach the ground safely, causing injuries to himself. As Sadaijin fights with the worm, Suzume notices a small blue light coming from a distance. Immediately, she realizes that Soda has been holding back the worm. Yet, without Daijin's true power, Sadaijin can't fight for much longer. She rushes to the light only to discover that this place is similar to the one in her dreams, yet the fire from the worm has caused destruction all over. Eventually, she reaches the icy blue light and forcefully tries to break Soda out of it. However, Daijin reveals that the worm will escape if Suzume continues. Unexpectedly, Suzume says that she's willing to become the keystone instead of Soda, which surprises Daijin. In the end, Daijin decides to help Soda escape the keystone and take back its original form. After desperately trying, Suzume begins seeing past memories of Soda and the happy days they spent together. In his last moments, Soda acted strong and brave. Yet, inside, he wanted to live more with Suzume and the rest of his friends. In the end, she successfully pulls his soul out of the chair and transforms him back into a human. With the keystone outside of its original place, the worm grows stronger and defeats Sa Dai Jin. Upon seeing this unfold, Soda tells her to follow everyone's footsteps until they reach a high ground. There, Soda chants a new spell, asking Sadai Jin for his help in placing the second keystone inside the worm. Sadai Jin listens to his prayers and comes rushing toward them. He launches Suzume into the air, allowing her to end things once and for all. Afterward, Suzume finds her younger self walking through the fields, looking for her mother. Despite young Suzume crying out to her mother, the older one calms her down telling her younger self that no matter how sad she is, she's going to grow up. The future's not scary, and she'll meet a lot of people she'll care for, and people who care for her in return. The night might seem endless now, but one day, morning will come. She'll grow up, basking in that light. With the light immersing them, young Suzume asks the older girl who she is. Our Suzume gives her the wooden chair, telling her, I'm your tomorrow allowing young Suzume to leave in peace. Our Suzume and Sota also safely exit the gate to their respective timeline. And as Suzume seals the door, she remarks that she'd been given everything that mattered a long time ago. The two then meet back with Tamaki and Tomoya, and on their drive back, Tamaki learns Tomoya was actually the one who owed Sota money, and the two giggled together as it seemed Sota forgot. Later, Suzume asks Sota to come back with them, but he can't because there's still places with gates he has to close on the way back to Tokyo. Before he leaves, he gives her a hug causing her to blush, all while he thanks her for saving him and promises to come see her. Then one day, as Suzume rides her bike, her eyes widen. Seeing the man she loves, she welcomes him back. What a nice ending to this tale. Subscribe to my channel for more content. Also, watch this next video. It's me, Comfy T. I'll see you all in the next one.